Turn with me over to 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever, whoever is born of God does not sin, talking about our new nature, but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. This has been our foundation scripture for the Devil Delusion series that God actually has, you know, in telling Paul, open your eyes they would, so that they can be delivered from the power of Satan, the authority of Satan over into my authority to the power of God. He put, he, 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 he's caused us to experience a place, to live in a place that the wicked one does not touch us. Amen. Now listen, if you, if you question through this series, if you still say, yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but, but the devil still does this. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. In, in other words, if you're not willing to truly believe this one phrase that you can be at a place that the wicked one does not touch him, let me tell you, child of God, you'll never experience this. You'll never experience this. You've got to settle it in your heart that what God said, he meant. And so start living your life with this attitude and with this outlook that the wicked one cannot touch me. And it is a lifestyle, it is an attitude of confidence, of boldness. It is not an attitude of, well, I hope this is true. I'm just going to try to lay low so that the devil doesn't know that I'm here and so that the devil doesn't attack me. You know, people won't say things confidently and boldly because they're afraid that the devil's going to hear them or that the devil's going to make sure it doesn't come to pass. In other words, they've got more faith in the devil being able to stop their blessing than they do in God being able to make it happen. And I'm telling you, if you cower, if you back up, if you shrink when you start thinking about the devil, what does the devil mean? Accuser. One who tries to separate through condemnation and through, uh, 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 through slander. That's all it means. He wants to accuse, 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 get you to believe something that is not true. He's a liar. He was a liar from the beginning. He's a liar now, and there's nothing that he says is true. So don't believe his lies. That's right. Come on. Believe the truth of the Word of God. Well, Pastor, I've got this going on in my life. Pastor, you don't know how my kids are. I don't have to know how your kids are. What I say is that when the Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? Then Paul said, believe on the Lord and you and your house will be saved. Paul wasn't just talking about just the jailer. He said, because once you come in, you got a covenant. God's going to start working on your kids. God's going to start working on that one that ran away. God's going to start working on that rebellious one. God's going to deal with him because you believe on him because God isn't just a one-person God. He is a generational God. He is about family. He came so that we would be called children of the Most High God. Praise God. Praise God. But if you're a manby pamby Christian, a wimpy outlook on life, and you just still think that darkness is going to be able to overcome you, guess what? You're going to experience that. But the Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. 1 John 3, 8, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy, unloose, unbind the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil in your life. Hebrews 2, 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy, render useless, render idle. That's what that Greek word meant, R render ineffective in your life. He might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. We found out in John chapter 12, verse 31, now the judgment of this world, or now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. 
cast out of where? We found out in Revelation chapter 12. So the great dragon, verse 9, there was a war in heaven, so there was a great, so the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Cast out of heaven. Called uh, the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Cast out. And so the Bible says the accuser of our brethren has been cast down, cast out. He is not accusing us anymore. Why? Jesus took all of our judgment. Jesus took all of our accusations. Now, you got to get this. You know, interestingly, out of this series, and I'm going to briefly mention this in, uh, in, for, for one minute, uh, the three, uh, the, I've had three people come up and ask me, the same question differently at different times. So if they've asked the question, you may have the question. I said this, the devil's never been to hell. For some people, that was the first time they'd ever heard that. The devil's never been to hell. He is afraid of hell or torment just as much as we are. The question that people have asked is, so if the devil's never been to hell, what about people? Have people been to hell? Well, the answer to the question is yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, Jesus talked about uh, before, uh, before he went to the cross, he talked about a rich man that had lived uh, wickedly through, throughout the years. And when he died, he went down into hell. But it's called Hades. That's the Greek word for it, Hades, which is basically the place of the dead. And so the rich man was over in a place of torment and fire, which, is, which, which basically describes hell. And Lazarus, this beggar, was in Abraham's bosom or a place that we call paradise. All right? But what happened is, is when Jesus died and went down into that place, the Bible says he, he preached to the spirits that were in prison. And so we know for a fact that the saints of God, in Matthew, it says that, uh, that when there was an earthquake, that the graves opened up and some of the saints walked through the city. Some of the old saints from the old covenant stopped on their way up to do a little tour of what the city looked like right then and then continued on to heaven because they believed in Jesus. But the Bible says that those that don't believe on Jesus aren't going to make it into heaven. That's just all there is to it. The only way, Jesus says, I am the way, not a way, the truth and the life. And so at the end, at the end of the age, there will be a time, I just want to read two quick scriptures just so that you know. In verse 41 of Matthew 25, as he separates the goats from the sheep, those that lived wickedly, would not believe on him. He said unto those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. God never intended for mankind to show up or to be in the lake of fire, but because of man's sin and because they did not choose to believe on Jesus the way, that's where they're going to find themselves. Now, I have good friends. I have good friends in the grace community that do not believe that hell exists, that do not believe that that's still uh, a place of eternal punishment, you know? And, and, and maybe if you're here, maybe that's what you believe. I'm just telling you, Jesus in two different places talked about these things. And when I listen to what he says, I'm not going to try to theologically, you know, work my way around it just because I want to try to fit what he says to fit my idea of what I think God's going to do. I can only tell you what the Word of God says. And, I, and, and honestly, to be honest with you, you know, I, I don't get caught up in it. I don't talk about hell much because it's not fear of hell that's going to get me saved. Some of you probably got saved because you wanted fire insurance, but for me, you know, I, it's the goodness of God that leads me to repentance. I want to talk about what he's done. I don't want to miss out on the greatness that he has for, for me, you know? I'm like, you're telling me that he's given me a kingdom? You're telling me I got an inheritance? Dude, I want that. Don't talk to me about the other. I want that. I want the abundant life. So that's why that's what we talk about. I'm talking about what he's done for us. I'm talking about where we're going. But don't make any mistake. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to be there. That's right. now, I know that's harsh, and I know, but it's the truth. I, do, I would not like to, to, to uh, risk my eternity on somebody's opinion. Amen. I would rather err on the side... <laughs> of truth, yes, of what I see. 
man, it's not worth it. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, this is awesome. At the end of the age, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Man, there's coming a time that the devil is going to be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever. Look at verse 14. It, well, it says then uh, there was a judgment seat and it says then, then death and Hades, that's the hell that we think about right now, but death and Hades, that, that realm of the dead, were cast into the lake of fire. It's going to be destroyed. This is the second death and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I can't, I can't expound on that. It seems, plen it, it seems pretty self-explanatory for me. Okay, so anyway, so if people today, uh, Paul said that for me to live is profitable for you, but for me to die is gain. I will go and be with him. So people that die today, if you die in the Lord, guess where you end up? You end up being with Jesus. You end up experiencing that. You get uh, uh, to, to come uh, into that place with other families that have gone before you. You get to you experience glory and, and all of that, and it's awesome. People who do not die in the Lord, I believe they end up in that same place where the rich man did, and that's in Hades, uh, in, in, in a place. Uh, Abraham's bosom is no longer there. It's not a holding place, and so do with it what you will, but that's what I believe I see in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, I'm going to deal for the next uh, few minutes. I knew I wasn't going to get very far with some of these things today, so I'm not going to even pretend to try. I need to deal with a very important issue that you've got to settle in your life. Okay? I'm going to ask a question. Just think about it. You don't have to answer it. Does sin... Does sin allow the devil access into your life? Does sin allow the devil access into your life? Well, let's, let's, let's answer that according to what we know, okay? The devil used sin to accuse us night and day before God. He used the law to judge us and to gain access into our life and went before God and said, I have a legal right. Again, Jesus told Peter, Satan has desired to have you to sift you as we. We have uh, illustration after illustration of this. So he used sin as his legal argument to gain access into our life. Now, we find that Jesus took all of our sin. Jesus took all judgment for our sin. So if Jesus took all of our judgment and God is no longer holding our sin against us, can Satan use that, our sin, to gain access into our life? No. Now, let me show you some scripture on this. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. You, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. All. Somebody say all. All. Having wiped out out the handwriting of requirements or judgments that was against us. He took that debt. Think of it like credit card debt. Think of a, if you stacked up all your debt, your mortgage, your, your car payment, your phone payment, your, your television payment, your uh, bed payment, your <laughs> people got so many payments, your credit card payment, and you just stacked it all up, and then Jesus came through and said, guess what? I'm going to pay that all off. I'm going to wipe it out. Whatever that debt was, he took care of. And not only, did, not only did he do that, he didn't just wipe it out. He said, now, keep my card in case they rack up anything else. 
He wiped it out, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way. Somebody say, out of the way. Having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, uh, triumphing over them in it. Accusations gone. No more. Turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. This is so awesome. You've got to settle this thing. You've got to settle this thing in your heart. This is where some people get upset, but I'm telling you, I'm showing you the word of God on this. All right, I need you to settle this in your heart because if you have any question about this, if you doubt regarding this, then, then what's going to happen is it's going to, your believing is going to give Satan an inroad into your, into your life. Some of you have experienced bad things, have experienced uh, 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 what you feel like you deserve because of something that you did. And so when it happens, you say, yep, I deserve that. Yep, I deserve that. Yep, this is happening to me because I deserve that. And so you you accuse yourself. You allow the devil to accuse you to you and to condemn you. And so you accept what's going on in your life because of something that you did and feel like that you have to pay the penalty for it. And when you do that, you move outside of the grace zone. If you don't know what that means, I talked about it last week. You you move outside of what Jesus did for you into a place where now Satan has access into your life because of what you believe, not because of what you did. Look, by this, but this man, look at this, so powerful. After he had offered one, somebody say one. One One sacrifice for sins forever sat down at the right hand of God. Look at the next verse. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Now I'm going to tell you, I hope you get the answer. How are his enemies going to be made his footstool? Through his body. We have the right and the privilege as a son of God, as the body of Christ, to carry out his authority here on the earth, to expand his kingdom here on the earth. We're not sitting here trying to get delivered from the devil. We've already been delivered. We've already been delivered from the darkness. We've got to have that mindset. We've got to have that thinking in our mind. And so what it does is it frees us from looking at what we're dealing with and frees us to go and expand his kingdom on the earth. I live with a mindset that the devil can't attack me, that the devil can't do things to me. The Bible says I can resist the devil. He just simply flees from me. I'm not going to give him access. I'm not going to give him place. The Bible says don't give him any place. So I don't think about that little turkey, that little guy that just wants to try to make himself bigger than he ought to be. I'm going out and I'm proclaiming. I'm spitting all over the place. It's anointed spit. (laughs) Glory to God. I'm proclaiming the truth that Jesus Christ has set us free and he whom the son sets free is free indeed not free for a while and then in bondage for a while and then free for a while and then in bondage for a while and then free for a while and having bad times for a while no i'm going from glory to glory not glory to problem and then glory to problem and then take two steps forward and one step back we got the wrong mentality i'm just whoo Foot loose and fancy free. Experiencing the life of God. Experiencing his glory. Praise God. Not even giving the devil a little thought. Jesus is waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. Look at the next verse. For by one offering, somebody say one. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I said, can you believe this? Can you believe this scripture right now? That through one offering, that God perfected you. Jesus perfected you. He's made you perfect. He's done it. Where did he do it? In your spirit, man. Your spirit is absolutely perfect, absolutely righteous. 
them that are being sanctified. Praise God. Look at the next verse. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he has said before, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And then finally, their sins and their lawless deeds. You get this? Get it? Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. The problem is, is you keep remembering them. You're the one that keeps bringing them up to God. God's not the one that's bringing them up to you. All right, now, in the final few minutes, so if, so if, if, if Jesus took it, if, if Satan can't have access through my sin, then does that mean that I'm just free to sin? Does that mean that I can just go do whatever I want? Does that mean that they're... Everybody's saying no. But let's make sure you know why you're saying no. All right? Romans 6, 1 through 2. I'm going to read through this kind of quick. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? What he is saying is because you've died to sin and because Jesus changed your nature, your new nature is not designed to sin. As a matter of fact, your new nature, you are a slave to sin, but now we are slaves to righteousness. Our default position, our default uh, uh, outlook on life is to do right, not to do wrong. So you first of all understand the new nature. Now look at this. Verse 6 says, knowing this, you know something. You live a certain way because you know something. When you know something, it changes the way you think. It changes the way you live. You know something that our old man, that old nature, it was crucified with him. That the body of sin for the purpose that that sin nature, that body of sin might be done away with, might be destroyed, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Now you either believe it or you don't. And then it says in, in verse 11, likewise also reckon yourselves, see yourselves, count yourselves, believe about yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus because that's who you are, our Lord. See, so I don't sin because that's, my, that's not who I am. I don't want to. It's not my desire to. All right, now let's go down to verse 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? So we're not under law. We're not under law anymore. We're, we're now under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the law that we're under. Shall we sin then because we're not under the law anymore? No. Do you not know, here it is, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin that leads to death or of obedience that leads to righteousness. The truth of the matter is, child of God, is that while Satan can't get access into your life, Sin still has consequences. If I become an alcoholic and if I drink alcohol, and uh, I know people get, people get upset with me when I start talking about alcohol because people like to drink. Uh, whatever, get over it. I'm just using it as an example, okay? You know, or, or if I decide to do drugs or if I decide to do this, guess what? It's going to render an effect in my body. It's going to have a consequence. Does that mean that Satan used that, uses that to have access into my body? No. It means that sin from the very beginning had a consequence, which was death. All right? If you'll look at, um, uh, let, me just, let me just finish this out. And so it says here, in verse uh, 18, and having been set free from sin, you've become slaves of righteousness. That is who you are. But now, verse 22 says, having been set free from sin. See, he's talking about you've been set free. You've been set free. But what have you become? You've become slaves of God, servants of God. This is who you are. You've got a whole new nature. You've got a whole new position. You've got a whole new thing happening. And you have your fruit to holiness. 
See, we're righteous with fruit that goes to holiness. That's what happens in a believer's life. I'm not thinking about how to get by with sin. Anybody that's creating a doctrine to figure out how they can get by with sin isn't really understanding the new nature on the inside of you. God says, I will write my laws on your heart. I will write them in your mind. There is something that tells you this is the way to live. This is the path to life. Enjoy this. When I choose to go God's way, I'm experiencing his rest, his blessing, his purpose in my life. When I choose to go the other way, I get myself out of kind of out of that place where I can experience his grace and just experience the consequences that come from sin, which ultimately leads to death. We see it. People that are ravaged by drug, drugs and addiction and stuff like that. Their lives, I mean, they, they, they financial ruin, family ruin. Uh, uh, their bodies are ruined. All of that isn't because the devil's getting in there and do it. The devil don't have to do nothing. Sin's already at work in their heart, in, in their life. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. You've become slaves of God. You have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. Again, let's not focus on the sin. Let's not focus on the death. The gift of God. Focus on the gift. Focus on Jesus. Focus on who he's created you to be. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. James chapter 1 verse 13. Two more scriptures and I'll close. Let no one say when he is tempted... Let no one say, let no, let no one say when he is tried. Let no one say when he's going through a difficult time. Let no one, don't say it. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Can I tell you, can I, can I give you a revelation? Sometimes the things you're going through is because of what you did. Decisions you've made. Stop blaming God. Stop blaming the devil. Stop being stupid. Take responsibility for what you have chosen. Now, God will help you as soon as you turn right back to him and say, Lord, I screwed up. God, I messed up. I have got myself into a mess and I do not know how to get out of it. Father, I thank you and I receive complete and total forgiveness. I thank you for that because Jesus already took my judgment. See, I'm telling you how to deal with this thing now. God, Jesus took it, so I'm not going to receive condemnation over this thing. I know I messed up, but God, your grace has got to help me get out of this mess. And I'm going to have to rely on you. Jesus, I rely on you. I thank you for wisdom. I thank you for the power. I thank you for the healing. I thank you, I thank you for, for the direction. I thank you for what I need. I thank you for that right now. And I'm going to trust you completely. Now, all of a sudden, you've just moved away from you and got back to him. Amen. See? All right? So, the first thing you got to deal with, don't let the condemnation, don't let the accusation. Yes, you're probably in the situation you're in because of your own fault. Some of you are in the financial problems that you're in because you keep doing things that God's told you to stop doing. You're not a good steward over what's in, in your hands. And you're not using the wisdom of God. How did, how did Solomon become the richest man in the world? Was it just because God just gave it to him? No. It's because God gave him the wisdom of what to do and how to do it. I mean, you read, you read his life. Wisdom in her right hand. Riches and honor. Left hand, long life or something along those lines. So if you keep going a certain way and keep getting the same results and keep wanting God to change it, something's not working. And you wonder, well, why, why am I not blessed? Well, maybe you are, but maybe you keep spending on stuff you're not supposed to spend it on. Yeah. I didn't think that was going to go over too good. Every each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. See, everyone is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust, the King James said, and enticed. 
then when that has conceived, you've thought about it. See, so what Satan wants to do is get you to think about something so that it'll produce sin in your life because he knows once you get into sin, then what will happen is there's a place for death to begin to work. Not that he's at work. All he wants to do is just get you away from God, get you away from what Jesus did. And then it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. Brings forth death. And then finally, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says this, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Look at the next verse. Now, uh, before we go to this next verse, a lot of times we like to use that scripture with money. Preachers are really good about taking the one scripture, go back to this verse 7, or the one scripture, verse 7, verse 7, and, and say, let's just, let's, just, let's, just figure, let's just figure out that for money. Give me some money so you can get a whole lot back. <laughs> Preachers are great to use it. And, you know, in context, he actually earlier talks about sowing into the ministry. If somebody has talked to you about uh, spiritual things, then sow into there. So it's not a wrong application. I'm not saying that. But I want you to see what Paul is saying in the next verse. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Would you stand with me, please? In Romans 8, it says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The battleground with the devil is simply in your mind. The battle is for your heart. The battle is for what you believe. That's all there is to it. The battle is for your faith. If he can get you to doubt, if he can get you to believe nothing, if he can get you to question, if he can get you not to, not to be bold when it comes to the things of God, then he's won because then you're just going to start walking according to the course of this world and just have natural results that happen because of what you do, because you don't know. Child of God, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, yeah. Lord, I thank you that even in, in, in today, we're not making light of, of sin, we, but we're making everything of Jesus and what he did. And Father, I thank you right now Thank you, Lord. Man, you know, can, can we take a few moments? Just listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen, listen. Now, next week, we're not talking about the devil at all. <laughs> we're talking about the birth of our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. But, but some, some of you have just let him beat you down in your thinking. Oh, man. You've allowed yourselves to live certain ways or whatever that is. And, 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 and some people get upset with me when I, when I teach this way, but I believe that Jesus came that I might have life and have it more abundantly. I believe that Jesus came not just, not just to bless me, but also to change me. I believe that Jesus came so that I wouldn't have to live like everybody else, but rather that I would have, that there's a whole new way of living, that I would experience a whole new way, you know? And, and, and so I've never understood why, why people want to try to figure out how to continue to live a certain way, but continue to live, you know, and, and continue to proclaim the grace of God. The Bible says that the grace of God teaches us it, it's a teacher to deny ungodliness and to live righteously and soberly in this world. And when we say, Jesus, you are my Lord, Jesus, you are my Lord, I'm saying I submit myself. It's what 1 Peter 5 says. Get this. 1 Peter 5 says that we submit ourselves to God. Then we resist the devil and he flees.
I want my life to be a complete and total submission to His glorious will for me, to His amazing plan for me, to, to the things that, that I felt like that I just wanted to hold on because, the, you know, because, you know, the judgment's taken. Yeah, Jesus took that. But He also, He came to deliver us from it, not so that we could live in it. Does that make sense? He wants us to be delivered from those things so that we can live fully for Him and experience His best. This is not law. This is not works, except to say that we were created for good works. We were created to experience His best. We were created. I'm not trying to become this. It is who I am. Get that. It is who I am. So that's who I am. And so what happens is now I believe. I told you everything. It's not about what we do. It's about what we believe. I believe I'm the righteousness of God. Say, I am the righteousness of God. I've been made perfect by Jesus' sacrifice. The wicked one does not touch me. Satan does not touch me. He cannot touch me. Man, some of y'all, it's the first time you've ever said something like that. See? So I'm, I'm living in a place that I believe differently. Now I'm creating. God's both in me to will and to do of His good pleasure. I'm not trying to change my life. Listen, listen. I'm not trying to change my life. I'm allowing Jesus to change me from the inside out. I'm stepping into who He's created me to be. And I'm resting in that. Maybe I should say it this way. Not that I'm stepping into, but I'm falling into. Does that make sense? I'm resting into. I'm saying, I'm, 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 ta I'm taking a nap. I'm just saying, Jesus, have your way. I'm resting in you. Do your work in my life. You see what I'm saying? I believe in you. I believe in you. Some of you right now, just lift your hands towards heaven. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you that you are my identity. I believe in who you've created me to be. The things that you've struggled with fall off right now in the name of Jesus. 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 Name of Jesus. If you've struggled with anger, if you've struggled with addiction, if you've struggled uh, with things that you've... Thank you, Father. Man, the Holy Spirit is right here, present right now, doing the work to set you free. Woo! Man. Man, I got goosebumps. It just hit me. Go on. Praise God. Not that we go by that feeling, but I'm telling you, Holy Spirit, right now, if you'll, if you'll connect in your heart, if you'll believe in this, Jesus, thank you. Say this. Jesus, thank you for setting me free. From this day forward, I see myself as free from the devil's influence and from sin's influence in my life. From this day forward, I see myself as the sinless, spotless child of God. Some of you almost choked right there. Some of you almost said, I can't do that. No, you, you have, you've got to, God said that about you. So I see myself as a sinless, say it, I see myself as a sinless, spotless child of God because that's the way you see me. And because I believe that, I have overcome the world. Come on, give him praise. Come on. Come on. Man, it's all about what he did. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Father. You received that this morning? Look, there's some other areas we'll deal with later on, but I'm telling you, the devil, he's, he's not what he... Man, it's not even about him. It's all about Jesus. You can live free from his influence. Amen.